Hello, and welcome to the Movie Universe. I'm your host, Movie Fan. Today I'll be doing another team up with the beautiful Bonnie from Joy Unicycle. Hi, Movie Fan. It's so great to see you again. Always glad to have you here, Bonnie. And I'm especially glad to have you here for this team up because today we got something really special lined up for everyone. In fact, Bonnie, since you were the one who came up with this idea, I think you should be the one to announce what it is we're going to do today. Thank you very much. So, basically, we are going to be talking about movies versus history. Now, we do get movies every now and then that have been on par with history, but we've also gotten movies that were way off course of history, as I'm going to put it nicely. Now, for the record, it doesn't mean that these movies are necessarily bad, but it does mean that these movies were very much inaccurate with real life. And we're not just talking one or two details. We're talking about the entire thing where lots of major events inside the movie were made up, especially compared to the actual real life. Today, that's what we're here to talk about. Now, truth be told, we've been wanting to do something like this for a long time, and I'm really excited to do this. How about you, Bonnie? Honestly, I am so thrilled about this movie, fan. I'm glad to hear that, Bonnie, because not only are we going to talk about movies versus history, we are going to make this a top 10 list. Making this the top 10 most inaccurate movies ever made. This is going to be a very special video for me because, as you all know, I'm a real history buff. And when it comes to movies that are based off of actual events, I go for historical accuracy. And I absolutely hate it when someone makes a movie and just claims that it's actual history when in truth it's a big fat lie. Now there are some exceptions, but those are very few and very far in between. And just for the sake of argument, and because I feel like doing this, I'm going to quote WatchMojo.com. For this list, we are talking about movies that are very inaccurate and can even damage your thoughts of actual history. So without further ado, let us get started with number 10, Pocahontas. Now I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone because this is always coming up on the inaccurate list. And with pretty good reason, because it's literally a huge laundry list full of inaccuracies. Now, I'm very familiar with the actual history of Pocahontas. And there's no denying this movie is very inaccurate to actual history. Probably the most obvious part would be Pocahontas herself. How in the movie, she's probably in her early 20s. Well, in real life, she was probably 13 years old. And here's a big one that a lot of people seem to ignore. Pocahontas wasn't really her name. Truth be told, she went by several names. Her real name was Metallica, and she even went by a different name, Amanut. Now, to be fair, she was called Pocahontas. It was more like a nickname for her, but still. And of course, I cannot talk about Pocahontas herself without talking about the big moment where she saves John Smith from being killed. That story isn't just inaccurate. It's a full-blown myth. And here's the funny part about it. This story has been going on ever since 1607 when Jamestown was founded. Now we all know how it went in the movie. John Smith is captured by the Powhatan tribe and Pocahontas goes in and saves him before he could be clubbed to death. Well, here's what really happened. He was captured by the Powhatan tribe and they bartered a little and he was released. When John Smith returned to England, he went around telling this big story about how Pocahontas saved him. That's how the myth got started, by John Smith himself. And here's the real funny part for you. He didn't just tell this story with Pocahontas being his savior. In fact, there are quite a few times he retold this story, only it was some other Native American girl that saved him. I'm not kidding, this is actually true. Now those are some big key points that a lot of people love to point out. But there are quite a few small details that a lot of people really just don't seem to point out for some reason. And for that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Bonnie. Thank you, movie fan. And since we brought up John Smith, that's another inaccuracy that they got. John Smith was not the adventurer that you see in the movie. No, 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 no. He was a harsh, cheating leader. That's what he was. And on top of that, John Radcliffe, they also got his character wrong. They made him the villain of the movie. And really, for no reason. In real life, I can't really say that he was the nice guy necessarily, but he was definitely less harsh and less of a cheater than John Smith. Again, keyword being less. But he certainly was not the guy going after gold, gold, gold. That's another thing that this movie also got wrong. They made it about everybody going after gold in Virginia when, really, they were not after Virginia to get gold at all. They were there to flat out colonize the place. So they were going to own this place. And on top of that, 
Have you noticed that the dialogue also feels a little wrong? It's less straightforward, less of a story, and more preachy. I mean, this is Fern Gully preachy. That part where Pocahontas saves John Smith and goes, This is where the path of hatred has led us. Suppose remotely for a minute that that had happened at all. She would not have said that. What was recorded that she would have said was, my head for his. This was not about hate or anything. At that time, she was not entirely aware of them hating each other. She was just more aware of the fact that they were there to colonize the place, and she was willingly helping them to at least not starve. She was not there to stop the hatred, much less fall in love with John Smith, which is another thing this movie also got wrong. Either half the people know that this is not true, or half of them have forgotten that it is not true, that Pocahontas and John Smith were not a couple. She pretty much treated him like a big brother. That was it. Like you said, movie fan, she was preteen when she met this 28-year-old John Smith. So, yeah, I think the movie deliberately aged her up just so that they could be a couple. And that's something that they got wrong. The reason why this is put on so many people's list and usually put it number one for how many things that they got wrong is because they got the most wrong out of many movies. The reason we're putting this at the bottom is because, well, out of all the other movies that we find more offensive, this one is not as offensive as... Well, let's say something like our next few choices. Indeed, because when it comes to this film, even though it's 90% fiction, the fantasy is much more fun than the real story itself. That's why it's at the bottom of the list. So now we're going to move on to number nine, Kingdom of Heaven. Now, Kingdom of Heaven was a story about a knight named Balian who goes to fight in the Crusades. On one part, it was supposedly to repent for the sins of himself and his dead wife. And to make a long story short, he becomes knighted by his father, and he serves under King Baldwin of Jerusalem. Then after the king dies, Guy of Lusignan was crowned king of Jerusalem, and he foolishly starts a war against Saladin. Guy is captured, and Jerusalem is left defended by Balian. Saladin marches on Jerusalem, he attacks it, and after a few days, Balian surrenders Jerusalem. Now that's just a little overview for those who haven't seen this movie, but it should give you a rough idea of what it's about. Now that I got that out of the way, let's get to the reason we're here, the inaccuracies. Now, as far as uh, inaccuracies go, a lot of people would probably classify this as history would. It's a little fact, but it's also a little fiction, too. In fact, if anything, I'd say it's uh, pretty even, actually. That's the funny thing about it. Let me give you a little example. Obviously, as we all know, the Crusades, they did happen. And every one of these characters actually did exist. And certain scenes, like when Reynald of Chatillon attacks a caravan and murders innocent people, that was true. And when Guy foolishly goes out to take on Saladin out in the open desert, that was true as well. And yes, the siege of Jerusalem really did happen. But it is during those exact moments, that's when Hollywood starts to take over. For instance, there's a lot of tension and issues going on between Guy of Lusignan and Balian. For instance, the movie puts it down that Guy hated Balian's guts ever since he first showed up. And they also put it down that the Queen hated Guy as well. And at the same time, there was a little love triangle going on there. Truth be told, she never loved Guy. She only was betrothed to him, that's all. But she was having a little fling going on with Balian. And that's one of the reasons why Guy hated him, because he knew. In fact, he hated him so much, he tried to have him killed. Whether or not he hated his guts in real life, that I don't know. I can't find any research on it. I mean, you'll never find that if you try. But I do know when Guy foolishly went to battle Saladin in the desert, he left Balian in charge. You don't leave the city in the care of someone you despise. One big thing that comes up all the time is Balian himself. All historians agree that his character was greatly exaggerated. Now, I'm not familiar with his story, so I can't really give an opinion on that. But there is one thing about him that I can talk about that was obviously an exaggeration. And that's his character profile. He comes off as this do-gooder. Let me give you an example. After he kills the knights who tried to assassinate him, he still tries to help Guy. And he knew very well who sent them. It's almost like they tried to turn him into a Power Ranger. There is one issue with this character that I just have to bring up, and that's this whole emphasis on protecting the people. 
Let's get real. For the time, nobody gave a damn about protecting the people. It was just all about protect yourself, protect your family, protect your interests. And in this case, protect the holy city from the heathens. Again, I'm not familiar with the true story of Balian, but I can tell you this. From reading what I've read about the Dark Ages and the Crusades, there is no one in history who was anything like this. Heck, let's not forget the stories about Richard the Lionheart being this great noble king who stood for his country and all that. That's not even the least bit true. But of course, there are other inaccuracies to this story. One big one would be the scene where Guy of Lusignan and Reynald of Chatillon are captured by Saladin. How the movie does it, Guy and Reynald are brought to Saladin. Saladin gives Guy a cup of ice, which he had in a gold chest. Guy takes the cup, but he passes it to Reynald. Reynald drinks it, and Saladin says, I did not give the cup to you. And he responds by saying, No, my lord. And then Saladin kills him. That's what the movie said. Here's what really happened. Guy and Reynald are taken to Saladin. Saladin gives Guy a bowl of water, which Guy drinks, and he gives the cup to Reynald. Saladin kicks the bowl out of his hand because it was not meant for him, and Reynald shouts out curses against Mohammed, and Saladin kills him. Probably the biggest inaccuracy in this story is the Siege of Jerusalem itself. In the movie, the siege goes for a couple of days until Balian finally surrenders to Jerusalem to Saladin. However, in real life, it went for at least a couple of weeks. And even then, in the movie, the entire siege, the way it all played out, how he knew they were coming, and how he planned for all this the way he did, like marking when to use the ballistas, when to use the catapults, when to start shooting arrows, that never happened. There is one more inaccuracy, and this one I can actually understand. Give me a minute, and I'll explain. There there's a scene where Reynald of Chatillon attacks a Muslim caravan, therefore kicking off that war that Guy wanted with Saladin. Of course, it wasn't so much the caravan being attacked that kicked it off. It's the fact that Saladin's sister was on that caravan, and Reynald had killed her. Now, this was partially true. He did attack a caravan, and there was a relative of Saladin's on that caravan. But it wasn't his sister, it was his aunt. Now this little inaccuracy is actually forgivable, because if you think about it, when you hear about somebody's aunt getting killed, you go, oh no, that's terrible. But when you hear that his sister got killed, you go, oh sh**, he's really gonna get it now. And that's pretty much all the inaccuracies that this movie has. And although I do find them annoying, the movie is still pretty good. Like I said before, historians would call this history would. Now before we move on, I gotta ask, Bonnie, I know you haven't seen this movie, but is there anything you'd like to add? There's not really much else that I can add to that. Though given what you've said about this, as well as, well, during the time that this was made, it was released in 2005, while they were half trying to make it accurate and half taking liberties with it, it seems like that they were more concerned concerned about making a grand epic because at that time the final Lord of the Rings movie came out and everybody was trying to be them. Heck Orlando Bloom is in this. So it kind of says a lot to me about that where they try to glorify them rather than actually tell a straightforward story. That's very true. And as much as I love to harp on Kingdom of Heaven for its inaccuracies, we got to move on to our next slot, which Bonnie will be taking from here because she knows a lot more about this than I. So, Bonnie, what's our next inaccurate movie? Mary Queen of Scots makes the number eight spot on our list. Most recent addition to our list and any list about historically inaccurate movies. And right off the bat, when we were seeing the trailers, we already easily saw the problem with the movie. One of the biggest issues was that it has Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth Queen of England talking face to face. Any of you who know the Tudor history know that they never ever spoke in person. They wrote letters to each other. That was it. And on top of that, further into the movie, it already developed a whole series of problems as well, including they made up that Mary and Henry Stewart's marriage went downhill was because on their wedding night, he was lying with a friend named David Rizzio. That never happened in real life. One of the things that had gone on to make the marriage go downhill was that Henry Stewart was jealous of Mary and outright accused her of having an affair with David Rizzio. So it was the other way around. 
Granted, they do somewhat fix that, but why did you throw that in there? Did you throw that in there just to make a gay character? Because it's one thing to do that in a fantasy movie, but it's another thing to do that in history. What are you doing putting that in history when it's never been recorded? So, yeah, that's wrong. That's like saying Joan of Arc was always a man. And on top of that, I already touched about how Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth never met in person. On the one hand, I can kind of understand why you had them meet in person, but it still doesn't quite work. You could make a slim argument that perhaps this is what the movie makers were saying. Oh, this is what we would have liked to see. Or they were taking a liberty license like what they did with Pocahontas and Anastasia. But here's the thing. With Anastasia, they had an excuse. This was what they hoped would happen until they eventually found Anastasia's actual remains. But with Mary, Queen of Scots, you don't have such an excuse for this. Because they never met in person. And the way they talk to each other all so in the letters, at least in the movie's version, they are cordial towards one another. They are still somewhat rivals, but they're very cordial to one another. In real life, they were rivals right off the start. The most amount of kindness that Queen Elizabeth ever showed Mary Queen of Scots was by keeping her safe in England, even though she kept her prisoner, and keeping her enemies away from her, and also trying to help her when it came to finding the right man to marry, which she made another mistake on. But aside from that, Elizabeth saw her as a rival for the crown, and rightfully so, because Mary Queen of Scots pretty much really believed that she was the rightful heir to the crown because, as we'll get into later, Elizabeth was the daughter of King Henry VIII but his second wife. And so, in all that, believing that Mary was the rightful heir. So the fact that you have them cordial in here doesn't really work, especially when you're trying to be historical. One other thing I should mention is that it has been recorded Mary Queen of Scots did not have a Scottish accent by the time that she got back from France because she had been raised in the French court since she was five years old. Yeah, she was born in Scotland, but she was raised in the French court. But in some ways, I also kind of give it a little bit of a pass compared to all the other flaws because it's the actress. She's Scottish and she does a really good job for what she was given. So I'm not going to rip into that as hard as I ripped into the other things. But it still is worth noting. Movie fan, you have anything to say about it? For this one, I don't. Because one, I think you pretty much summed it all up. And two, unfortunately, when it comes to the Tudor times, my knowledge stops with Henry VIII. And because of that, it's time to move on to number seven. Lawrence of Arabia. Now, I've talked about this once before in my review of the most boring movies ever made. And this movie is still number one on that list. However, that's not the issue here, but it's going to take everything I got to not repeat that. The movie is about the World War I campaign of famed British officer Thomas Edward Lawrence. And it's really quite simple to explain. It goes exactly like this. He goes into the desert. He talks to Arabic tribes, convincing them to join in the revolt to destroy the Ottoman Empire. And he wanders through the desert. He dresses up like an Arab. He wanders back through the desert, dresses up like a British officer. He wanders back through the desert again, dresses like an Arab. He wanders back and forth and back and forth, dressing up as a British officer and an Arab. A British officer and an Arab. Until finally, his army attacks a city and then a train. That's how the movie goes. It's 99% playing dress-up and 1% battles. That's three hours of my life I'll never get back. Anyway, in real life, yes, he unites the Arabs. And yes, he was known for dressing up as an Arab while he was there. It makes sense. The clothing attire is a lot better suited for the desert than dressing up as a British officer. But here's the thing. He did more than just play dress-up and unite the Arabs. He also did something that everyone said could never be done. He destroyed the Ottoman Empire. And by doing this, he cut off the oil supply going to Germany and Austria-Hungary. This is important because mechanized warfare was getting started, and they needed a lot of oil to make gasoline and to oil the tanks and get them moving. 
without that oil, they were sunk. By doing this, he killed two birds with one stone. And the movie doesn't even acknowledge this, really. All they do is have him play dress-up the whole time and wander through the desert. What's even more baffling is the fact that the British made this movie, and they're real big into history. And here they decide to just make it a movie about a guy playing dress-up. Bonnie, do you understand this at all? Yeah, why they decided to make it about a guy who plays dress-up, I have no idea. But at least they do it with Peter O'Toole, right? Yeah, never mind. Back to the inaccuracies, they did get a lot wrong, but then again, I think that was common for the movies in the 1960s, during an era where they wanted to be grand and glorious and something to behold for their audiences, which I don't blame them. This was during an era where actors and sets were glamorous and glorious. But here are some of the things that they got wrong, or at least some of them are debated. Like Lawrence's character behavior is heavily debated on how he's represented. In the movie, he's represented as an egotist without making clear as to what degree he sought it or avoided attention. And it also barely mentions about his actual travels in Syria and Arabia from 1911 to 1914. But his behavior aside, what is not debated and what is factual? Well, one of the things they for sure got wrong was General Allenby's behavior and the way he's represented in here as a cynical and manipulative with a superior attitude towards Lawrence. Well, in real life, they were friends, and they both respected one another. In fact, upon Lawrence's death, General Allenby has been recorded to say that he lost a dear friend. So, they got that wrong for sure. I guess the movie needed some kind of antagonist, unnecessarily. Also, the attack on Aquaba was also inaccurate. Also, dealing with the Arab Council were inaccurate. And also... This is a pretty big one. The second half of the film really portrayed a completely fictional depiction of Lawrence's Arab army deserting and almost to a man as he moved farther north. That's a pretty bad thing when you got the second half completely fictionalized. Maybe not bad for a movie per se, but bad when you're trying to represent history. And clearly that was not this movie's first goal. This movie's first goal was telling a story, which in itself is not terrible, but that is why this is on the list. Because it doesn't work if you're going to study the subject of T.E. Lawrence. Yeah, this just goes to show you that if you want to learn about actual history, you need to do your research. The fact is, you will not learn real history from watching movies. This film alone is a shining example. The sad thing about this is, T.E. Lawrence's exploits are so well documented, they should have been more accurate than this. Now, you would think that we would put this higher, but let's get real, folks. The real fatal flaw in this movie is the fact that it is so damn boring. That's its fatal flaw. The inaccuracies are just a tip of the iceberg, but they're still pretty bad. But not half as bad as number six, In the Heart of the Sea. This movie was based off of the legendary story that helped inspire the legendary book, Moby Dick. And as I'm sure you all remember, this movie was directed and produced by the legendary Ron Howard. The story is about a group of whalers on a whaling ship known as the Essex. They go out hunting whales so they could get oil out of them. For a good part of the story, you see them living the life on the ship. You know, it's your usual stuff. Searching for whales, they swab up the deck, that usual thing. And they're having no luck at all. And the captain decides to go to a different location to see if there are any whales there. And they find lots of whales. They start getting a few of them. Until one fateful day while they were busy whaling, a large bull whale rams the ship, damaging it so severely that they had to abandon it. To make a long story short, they're floating on their little whaling boats for months. They come to a small island that they try to take refuge on, but they decide there's not enough food there, and supposedly there was a lot of dead skeletons there that it spooked them into running away. Of course, three of them do stay behind because they figure they got a better chance there than they do out in the open ocean. And the survivors who left the island, they are forced to resort to the unthinkable act of cannibalism. Sadly, it was the only way they could survive. And at the same time, they were being stalked by that whale that sunk their ship. Until the whale finally decides that they learned their lesson, and eventually what few survivors are left are finally rescued. The movie itself is okay, the action is pretty darn decent. But this movie is on the list because it is incredibly inaccurate. I have to admit, 
When I first saw the movie, I did not think it was inaccurate. I mean, yeah, maybe one or two moments, but I didn't actually know how inaccurate it was until this was on the list and I had to look up a few things. And yeah, we found some pretty strong inaccuracies in here. Let's see, what's a good inaccuracy to start with? Let's start with the fact that the first book written about this event was published literally a year after the survivors came back. So right off the bat, this story was no secret. And the movie opens up with one of the survivors, Thomas Nickerson, treating it like a secret. Yeah, a lot of what they did was unspeakable, but it was no secret that all this had happened. Also, another thing to note about the intro is how it starts with Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, meeting Thomas Nickerson, who is supposed to be the last survivor of 1850. Um... Two things wrong with this. The first thing is that there were still at least six survivors alive at that time still, including Nickerson. The other thing that's wrong with it is that Herman Melville actually spoke with Owen Chase's son about these events and learned about them through his son. Why this movie did not do that, I have no idea. Why it wanted to focus on only the last survivor, I guess they wanted to do it for dramatic reasons, but the story is a drama in itself without needing to be extra. And that brings up another problem, movie fan. Do you want to talk about it? I certainly do, Bonnie. But before I do that, I want to mention a few more things that we need to bring up. Another thing that did come up was Owen Chase's son. Not only did he talk to Herman Melville about it, he also lent him a copy of his father's book. And that's an important thing here because Owen Chase was the first one to write about what happened with the Essex. And Thomas Nickerson was the last one to write about it. Which might explain why they chose Thomas Nickerson to be the guy that Herman Melville's interviewing. But still, not only is that a slap in the face to what actually happened, in a way it's also a slap in the face to Herman Melville as well, because of the origin of his legendary novel. And another thing, Thomas Nickerson was not the last survivor. The last survivor of the Essex was Seth Weeks, and he died in 1887. Of course, that's just scratching the surface of the inaccuracies. Probably the biggest, most unbelievable inaccuracy is the whale itself. They put it down that it was gray with white splotches, and they constantly keep referring to it as the white whale, or a white whale. To quote one person who reviewed this movie, it was like they tried to turn it into Moby Dick. One of the things they actually do get right is the fact that the whale struck the ship. That is true. That definitely happened. That was one of the big inspirations where Moby Dick rams the ship and sinks it. However, this movie also claims that the ship literally blew up in a burst of flames. That never happened. In fact, it actually floated for days before they decided to abandon the ship. But that's Hollywood for you. They always have to have a huge explosion in there somewhere. Probably the most biggest, most unforgivable lie that's in this movie is the part where the whale is stalking them. He's constantly attacking them until finally they have a showdown and Owen Chase and the whale look at each other and they both stand down and the whale leaves. That whole ordeal comes off like the whale was trying to teach him a lesson. Like, how does it feel being hunted, huh? It's not so funny when it happens to you, is it? That's pretty much the impression I got out of that. And that never happened. And another fact, sperm whales don't do that. They don't go around stalking people. The thing that really saddens me the most about this is the fact that Ron Howard was the man who directed and produced it. Let's not forget, this is the man that made Apollo 13. And for those of you who don't know, Apollo 13 has been called the most historically accurate movie ever made. But of course, there's more inaccuracies to this movie than just the whale itself. In fact... What this movie also got wrong was that the survivors abandoned the island because they saw the dead bodies, but actually it was because they ate up everything in there. All the resources were gone, so they had to leave. And then, of course, resorted to eating each other, which leads to another thing they got wrong. Not only did they get wrong the scene where Captain Pollard draws the lot that means that he's gonna die, but actually... It was Henry Coffin who really drew the lot. But actually, that's another thing they got wrong. That's two things they got wrong in one. 
the two things they got wrong in that moment, as well as in the movie, is that it was not Henry Coffin, but Owen Coffin. That was his real name. I can understand why they changed it, because they don't want the audience confused with Owen Chase and Owen Coffin, especially if they, like, call for their first names. They didn't always call for their first names. They called for their last names. In some ways, it's kind of a nitpick, but in other ways, it's not really that much of a nitpick. It's really kind of a problem, especially if you're trying to base yourself off of history. Give Pocahontas some credit. There were a bunch of Johns in the Pocahontas movie, and yet they still kept their names. John Redcliffe, John Smith, and later John Rolfe. Why couldn't they do that here? But what they also got wrong about it is that Owen Coffin drew the lot the whole time, and the tragedy of that moment was that he was the captain's ward. And the captain actually offered to take his place, and Owen refused it, willing to die so that everybody else could live. And yeah, that is a sad story. And not because he was a jerk redeeming himself the whole time, no, 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 because he was the captain's ward, and the captain was supposed to look out for him, but ended up eating him after he was shot, which was not by suicide by the way. I guess in some ways Ron Howard didn't have the stomach to do that scene, but at the same time, yeah, like you said, movie fan, this is coming from somebody who directed Apollo 13 and got it very accurate. And on top of that, he is taking on the chance of retelling the story of the survivors who took drastic measures to survive. So, yeah, either he should not have directed this or he should have gotten a co-director to help him with this. Because if you're going to do this, you can't expect to leave out a survivor's details like that. Granted that he made a very beautiful looking movie, but it's a survivor story. And if you're really going to tell a survivor story, you need to follow at least the major details of what had happened. No truer words were spoken, Bonnie. And that is a key fact here. You need to follow the details. You can't just take liberties with it like this. And that's part of the problem. This movie takes too many liberties with what really happened. For instance, they put it down that most of the crew was eaten. That's not quite true. In fact, what really happened was three whaling boats that had crew members in them disappeared one night. Nobody knows what happened to them. All they know is that they all went to sleep, they all had their boats closely huddled together, and when they woke up, three of the boats were gone. Nobody knows what happened to them, and we never will. Yes, cannibalism was a part of it, but what about those missing boats? Think about that. And speaking of cannibalism, there is one thing I do like about this movie, and that's the fact that they do not show you the cannibalism. They just talk about it. And when they're rescued, you see the bones of the men that they consumed. There's nothing wrong with that scene. In fact, I think it's a vast improvement because the fact is you know what happened because Thomas Nickerson told you. The problem with Hollywood these days is they think they have to show every bloody detail, brains being splattered all over the wall and all that stuff. But for something like this, I think that was completely unnecessary. And obviously Ron Howard did too. That was one of the few things he did right in this picture. Instead of just showing it like everyone else would, you cut back to Thomas Nickerson telling Herman Melville about this. And you could see the look of horror and disgust in his face. A man who was really ashamed of what he did. That speaks for itself. Wouldn't you agree, Bonnie? Absolutely, movie fan. And... It is one of the reasons I admire and respect Ron Howard as a director. I mean, he does a terrific job. I couldn't have said it better myself. And there is one more inaccuracy that we need to talk about, and that's the whole story that supposedly they never went back to sea ever again, like it was post-traumatic stress syndrome. That never happened. Nearly every one of them went back to sea. Now, I could ask, why did Hollywood decide to claim that none of them went back to sea? But let's get real, folks. We know the answer. It's because of the overhyped post-traumatic stress syndrome that has been brought on by terrorism and fighting the war on terror. That's the only reason they did it. I'm just going to end that whole part with saying these little lines. Enough is enough. We don't need more of this post-traumatic stress syndrome crap. Now that we got that out of the way, we're going to move on to number five, The Other Bullion Girl. Now, I'll be honest with everybody. I've never seen this movie, and I am not very familiar with the story at all. So for this one, Bonnie's going to have to take the wheel. Take it away, Bonnie. Oh, boy. The Other Bullion. 
Golden Girl. I've been waiting for this one. When it comes to historically inaccurate movies, few people seem to talk about this one. Maybe one of the reasons is because it's originally based off of a book that is based off of a history, and it's under the same name, The Other Boleyn Girl. How accurate this is to the book, that's another story. We're going to talk about how this compares to history. Now, to summarize or to jog a few memories, this is basically about Anne Boleyn, who eventually became Henry VIII's second wife, and her point of view on everything that had happened. Now, the movie in itself isn't that bad. In fact, one of the few praises I actually give this movie is that Natalie Portman actually eerily almost looks like Anne Boleyn. And the costumes are terrific, but we're not here to talk about costumes or the acting, which both are fine. How's the accuracy? Wah, wah, wah. The first one is that Mary Boleyn was the older sister of Anne Boleyn, and Anne Boleyn was not the oldest as portrayed in the movie. Also, the movie shows Anne Boleyn being sent to France as punishment for marrying a nobleman without consent to the family, which, yeah, that could happen every now and then, but she was not sent to France for that reason. She was schooled there at the age of 12 and made her debut in the English court at age 21. So she did not get sent there for any punishment or any cover-up. I mean, there is speculation on whether or not she married a nobleman behind her family's back, but she was not sent to France for that reason. Also, there is a scene where Henry VIII rapes and just as the divorce is closing up, um, no. Most of you who know the Tudor history know that Anne Boleyn basically refused to become the king's mistress, which is the mistake that her sister Mary Boleyn did. But she basically was saying, I'm not going to sleep with you unless I become your queen, which led him to eventually divorce Catherine of Aragon, his first wife. And after a huge battle with the Pope and so on and so forth, he finally got his divorce. And she eventually consented to having sex with him. And then when they realized that she was pregnant, they quickly married and she had a coronation. He never raped her. She played his consent constantly. <sighs> this scene really ticked a lot of people off who knew the history. There's a moment where Anne Boleyn, upon realizing that she has miscarried again, decides to attempt incest with her brother so that she could hide the fact from Henry VIII that she's lost her child again, which was a boy for once. I, I don't know why that that was added. I really, really don't know because that never happened. She never stooped to such a disgusting low. That was one of the things she was accused of, but these were trumped up charges against her. She never did that. If I may interject on that one for a minute there, Bonnie, I think I may have the explanation as to why that came about. When I was in college some years ago, I took a history class, and we talked about Henry VIII and all of his wives, and one of the big things that came up was the fact that he wanted to get a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. To put it simply, my professor put it down that Anne Boleyn manipulated him into trying to get that divorce knowing very well that the Pope was not going to grant him set divorce. So why push him? Well, supposedly Anne Boleyn was a Protestant, and by manipulating Henry into trying to get that divorce, which she knew wasn't going to happen, she could convert him to the Protestant religion and have it take over England, which did happen for a while. Now, I don't know if that's 100% true, but it's no secret that she was very much hated by the people because, technically, she was the reason that the Protestant religion came into England. That's why I think they threw that in there, just to demonize her a little bit more. Even after 400 years, there's still people who want to demonize her. Also, almost everybody comments on this as well. The execution scene was also done terribly. It's the moment where Anne Boleyn gets executed. You could see that she's trembling and crying and aware of the sword that's about to take her head off. In reality, that never happened. What really happened is that she, yeah, she panicked when she was in the tower for a while, but by the time the day of the execution came, you would never have guessed that she was going to an execution because she carried herself with such a gaiety and a joyfulness and such dignity to a point where it didn't even look like she was about to die. And everybody took pity on her. There were eyewitnesses there that recorded her reactions and everybody else's reactions. 
everybody who hated her from the beginning at first finally took sympathy on her plight after she addressed them. And the executioner also was so moved by what she said and how she carried herself that he distracted her attention before grabbing the sword that was hidden from her sight. So, yeah, they also got that wrong, but... The biggest part of the movie that they got wrong was that Mary Boleyn was absent from the court during most of the Queen's reign. After Henry VIII married Anne Boleyn, Mary was pretty much out of the picture. So she never pleaded for Anne's life, she never saw her die, and she never raised Elizabeth I. So, yeah, this movie really had a lot to answer for for being very inaccurate. Movie fan? Anything you want to add about it? Or your thoughts? Actually, Bonnie, there is something I would like to add. It's a little off-key, but it does apply here in a small way. As inaccurate as this movie obviously is, they actually got a couple facts right. I know, right? Anyway, here's the facts that they actually did get right in this story. The first thing they got right was that Mary Boleyn was married, and yet Henry VIII asked her to be his mistress. And believe it or not, she actually agreed to that. And this was when Queen Catherine of Aragon was still on the throne. The second thing they got right was Anne's execution. And no, I'm not talking about what Bonnie had already discussed. That was completely false. I'm talking about what she was executed with. A sword. That is 100% true. She was executed with a sword. Why is this important? Well, there's a popular belief that when nobles were executed, they were always executed with an axe. Now, there is some truth to that. A lot of people were executed with an axe, but not everyone. And the funny thing, when everyone talks about Henry VIII, they always talk about him executing his wives with the axe. When truth be told in this story, she was beheaded with a sword. This may not seem like much, but it's actually more important than you think, because it helps kind of curve that popular belief. And that's pretty much all I have to add to this. So we're going to move on to number four, Braveheart. Ooh, we've come to one of the high ones now. When it comes to historically inaccurate movies, this is usually among the top ten or even top five. Why? Because unlike the other Boleyn girl that did get some things right, this movie is pretty much like 90% made up in so many plot points. So we know the movie to basically be about William Wallace, who was the Scottish freedom fighter, you could basically say. All were enslaved by England, and he and an army rise up, and then ultimately he gets betrayed by a friend and is captured, and after a quick unfair trial, he is executed in, well, one of the most gruesome ways. Which, let's be honest, the movie lightened the gruesomeness. But that is just only part of what they got wrong. What is one of the things that they got wrong? Oh, um, let's see. William Wallace being born poor, when actually he was aristocrat from the start. And also, Thinking about this, it is kind of an insult to Robert the Bruce because he was considered the Braveheart, not William Wallace. In calling this movie Braveheart and basing it on William Wallace, in some ways it's kind of an insult to Robert the Bruce for all that he did. And they also make it that William Wallace starts the revolution because his wife has died. Uh, that was made up. That was completely made up. I don't know why Mel Gibson felt that that was needed in there, because that clearly never happened. Just the prima noctis idea, for those of you who don't know what I mean, basically the English soldiers will show up to a Scottish wedding, take the bride away, rape her, and then bring her back the next day. That was prima noctis. Another thing that happened, I don't know why they did this, is all the male Scottish characters wore kilts. Did you look up your years yet? This movie takes place in the 1200s. The kilts were not invented until the 1800s and nobody wore blue face paint and bagpipes were not used at the time. And the English soldiers did not have uniforms until the English Civil War. Was this movie doing any research at all? I'm going to guess not because that doesn't seem to be their first concern, which is really tragic. The movie itself is obviously an epic, but... It really got so much wrong, and that's just part of it. Movie fan, do you want to add any more? You better believe it. Besides the kilts and the bagpipes, 
which didn't exist until way later, probably one of the most iconic symbols of this movie would be William Wallace's sword, the Claymore. Whenever anyone talks about that movie, that is one of the first things that comes to mind is that sword of his. And <laughs> I hate to tell you this, folks, that sword did not exist until the 14th century, which was literally 200 years after the Scottish War of Independence. And coincidentally, it was roughly the same time that bagpipes were first used in Scotland. Probably one of the most irritating inaccuracies in this picture is they practically said that Robert the Bruce was the one who betrayed Wallace and turned him over to the English. And historians will definitely tell you that is definitely not true at all. Robert the Bruce was one of the people who really fought hard to free the Scots from English tyranny. In fact, he and Wallace worked together for quite a number of years until finally Wallace was captured. The Bruce greatly respected Wallace. In fact, he learned many tactics from him, especially using spears against cavalry. Long story short, Robert the Bruce wouldn't have betrayed him. But just to get the record straight, who was it that really betrayed him, Bonnie? In answer to your question, movie fan, it was Sir John de Matenith. He was a Scottish knight who was loyal to Edward I. He was the one who turned him over to the English soldiers, not Robert the Bruce. Just the fact that they put that in, as well as gave the Braveheart name to William Wallace, adds double to the disrespect. And also, I can't let this go. I, I really cannot let this one go. The fact that they threw in Princess Isabella having an affair with William Wallace. I would have believed it if I did not read about Princess Isabella, who eventually became Queen Isabella, and who had nothing to do with William Wallace, because at the time of his death, she would have been nine years old. It really makes no sense. What are you doing throwing in Princess Isabella at all? And also, I originally said that they got the death of William Wallace. I won't go into details about how he died, because... I don't think you guys will want to hear it, but basically William Wallace's actual death was a lot more violent than what was shown on screen. I guess in this case it's a little better that way, so I'll give it that. When it comes to this movie, it is critically acclaimed. It is a wonderfully well done movie, well executed, well shot and everything except the history aspect. I guess in some ways this movie kind of leads to a debate on whether or not movies should always be historically accurate or if it's okay to turn it into an epic drama. In some cases I can understand both sides of the argument but I still really try to respect the accuracy or try to respect what really happened in history and not just make things up on the spot. If you want to make up your own story that's great. I'd love to see how you do fiction like that, Mel Gibson, but this is not fiction. William Wallace was a real person. There was a poem written about him, but that's about it. He was a real person, and his life was an epic of its own. So epic that they wrote poems and legends about him. If you wanted to say that this movie was not accurate, that's fine. Do what the Danny Kaye Hans Christian Andersen did and put in the beginning of the movie, this was a fairy tale life, it's not accurate. That would have been fine. But since you didn't do that, this is why it's pretty high on the list. There is no denying that this movie is very epic. And I totally agree, this should have been written off as a fantasy. Heck, it's been done before. I mean, there's millions of movies that depict Wyatt Earp, and every one of them are false, except for the Kevin Costner film and the movie Tombstone. The point is, for those original films like the TV series Life and Times of Wyatt Earp and that, they never tried to say that this really happened. Everyone knew it wasn't real. They just loved the legend more than the fact. Because he really was a legendary character. Same could be said about William Wallace. He was a legendary character. They should have just taken that approach. And, you know, before we move on, I want to point out a huge sense of irony here. And that's the fact that Mel Gibson played down the execution. He made it not as gruesome as the entire film. Think about that for a minute. The entire movie is epically gruesome beyond belief. It was one of the most violent movies to come out back then. Heck, thinking about it now, the violence was enough to rival Mortal Kombat. So I find it very shocking that Mel Gibson did not make the execution as violent as it really was. I mean, this is a man who loves making violent movies, so it's very ironic that he did this. Of course, it is possible that he had no choice but to do that, or else it would have been rated X or M for Mature, and back then, you wouldn't see movies like that in theaters. But that's only a guess. Anyway, we're going to move on to number three, Patch Adams. 
Now, I think most of us are very familiar with this movie. It's a story about a doctor who checks himself into the loony bin because of depression. While he's there, he realizes that he could do a better job than all the doctors at the mental institution. Because the fact is, they don't care about their patients. So he sets out to change that. First by going to medical school, and of course by entertaining his patients. Which is probably what everyone remembers best about the movie. Because Robin Williams really made you laugh in there. And he especially made his patients laugh even harder. For a good part of this film, it became that whole story of laughter being the best medicine. But of course, the doctors didn't like that because they're not supposed to be close to their patients. They're supposed to be robots that don't care. That way, they won't be all depressed and take it home with them and all that junk. The worst doctor, of course, was his teacher, who was pretty much this Texas Southern drill instructor, as they called him in the movie. Of course, there was one other thing he did in this movie, and that was create his own clinic. But he does have a heck of a time getting that clinic off of the ground, because, well, he did it by snatching a few things that weren't his. I'm talking like medications, bandages, that sort of thing. And in the end, his clinic is up and running, that drill instructor of a doc is told to get a life, and the medical board agrees that it's time to change the way they've been treating their patients. By that, I mean bedside manner, not the way they give them injections or anything like that. That's the way the movie goes. How it goes in real life is a very different story. Wouldn't you agree, Bonnie? Absolutely, movie fan. And I will say, a majority of the biographical movies, this is among one of the most simplified I have seen or heard of. The story of Patch Adams is more intriguing than what they show in the movie and completely different, actually not just different, but more in depth than what the movie did. It simplified everything and everybody. It simplified the doctors into nonconformists because it's most unorthodox to have bedside manners in order to make Patch Adams look like the hero. You know, you really, really could make him likable or look like a hero without simplifying everybody else. And you mentioned earlier that he stole supplies from hospitals Ladies and gentlemen, do you really want to say that about a hero? They steal from hospitals? Because that is just disgusting. Say what you will about anything else, but to say that your hero steals from hospitals is the equivalent of saying your hero kills a puppy. And in talking about how simplified this movie is, they barely acknowledge the fact that Patch Adams really studied for his degree. He didn't just clown his way to an A+. He really, really did study it. But all along, he also was a clown. Yes, he did both. And he was also an activist for medication and how to treat patients. He wasn't just a Robin Williams clown. And before anybody gets upset, I like Robin Williams. I really do. I look up to him, especially for comedy. But he's not Patch Adams in here. He's Robin Williams. And when you're trying to portray somebody, you need to be the person. You can't just play yourself on there. Let me take an example for another biographical movie that was more historically accurate. The Temple Granted movie with Claire Danes. How could they have portrayed her? They could have made Claire Danes play herself, this glamorous blonde with beautiful lipstick and a clean face and clean hair. And then maybe give her a stereotypical Texan outfit. But no, they didn't do that. What they did was they made an attempt to make her look and sound just like the person she was supposed to be and behave like her. And it got to a point where the real Temple Grandin thought that she was looking back at her past and everything was too familiar. Whereas for this movie, Patch Adams, the real hunter Patch Adams looked at this movie and was basically embarrassed by this movie. Patch Adams didn't like how he was represented as just a clown and not as an activist as well. It was supposed to represent the early part of his life, but during the early part of his life, he did more than just wear a big red nose and clown around. Yeah, red nose is his trademark, but he did more than just wear a red nose and clown around. He believed in community. He believed in, in making the world smile, laugh, love, and so on. He was not into just laughter, laughter, laughter. And I should bring this up in a section where they retell his story. They had in a love interest and she has endured molestation and eventually comes to love him but then gets murdered. 
That never happened. What really happened was that Patch Adams had a close male friend who was not a love interest, by the way, and he was murdered. Patch Adams did not have a love interest that was murdered. It was a male best friend. Was it really too much to ask Hollywood to represent that right? Movie fan, what do you think? Oh, no doubt. They could have done a better job with that. I mean, I don't know why they always think they need to do this love interest thing, but that's Hollywood for you. They always have to throw a love interest in there. It's practically a requirement, just like all the leading ladies must be supermodels. And, of course, all the leading men must look like Brad Pitt or George Clooney. As to the question of why did they have to turn him into a big joke, that's beyond me. As much as I love Robin Williams, they really should have tried to make him more like the actual person. That would have been a huge improvement. Bonnie, do you know of any ways this could have been improved? Honestly, I think there are a couple of ways this movie could have been heavily improved upon. One is get a better script writer, because... While Robin Williams was giving it his all, he really could not save the movie from bad writing and simplified storytelling. They're all good actors, but they couldn't save it. But what I think would have been an even better thing is if they were filming the real Patch Adams as a documentary and he shares about his life and Robin Williams is maybe volunteering in the clinic and joining the real Hunter Patch Adams in making people laugh. That would have been an awesome thing. I would have loved to see something like that. But because of what we got, this is why it's pretty high on the list. And sadly, it's the last film that has any amount of delight in it. Movie fan, should we move on to the next one? I'm scared. I know, Bonnie, but we have to go through with this. We've come this far, and we got to see it right through to the end. So let's move on to number two, Pearl Harbor. Now, we've already talked about this before when we reviewed the movie. And as I'm sure you've already figured out, this movie is this far up on the list because it is incredibly inaccurate. That was one of its fatal downfalls, as I'm sure most people are very much aware. And because we already talked about this before, we're going to re-air that original footage that we made talking about the inaccuracies. Because, let's get real. The only thing we'd be doing is talk about the same thing. However, there are a few more inaccuracies we overlooked, and we will cover them in a few minutes. Before I start chewing this movie up for its inaccuracies, I think you need to listen to what Bonnie has to say first, because she's got a very interesting thing to tell you. The floor is all yours, Bonnie. In an interview done by Frank Weta, who was interviewing the producer Jerry Bruckheimer, he defended the movie by saying, and I quote, we tried to be accurate, but certainly not meant to be a history lesson. Okay, I'll give you that the bombing of the ships was pretty accurate, but here's something that was not accurate. The fact that you put the two fictional characters, Rafe and Danny, in place of second lieutenants George Welch and Kenneth M. Taylor. You replaced them and made the fictional characters the ones who took to the skies and shot down six Japanese aircrafts as they were going for Pearl Harbor. First of all, Danny and Rafe have no right to that because, one, they were out in the car in a far distance away from Pearl Harbor after a drunk overnight. Second, why are you putting these two main characters in place of two actual people who actually did that? That is pretty much a slap in the face to them. And you know what? I'm not the only one who says that. Let's take it from 2nd Lieutenant Kenneth M. Taylor, who actually saw this movie. And here's what he said about this. He called this movie a piece of trash and over-sensationalized and distorted. If a survivor of Pearl Harbor is saying that this is a bad representation of what they went through, then... Yeah, you should be ashamed of yourselves. And the fact that you tried to be accurate, but in trying to be accurate, you put the main characters in place of actual characters. Jack and Rose never replaced real-life characters. They weren't the old couple who decided to die together in bed. They were not the little girl who never got to say goodbye to her father. They were just regular passengers who happened to be there. 
They didn't replace anybody. So, yeah, this movie is pretty much flat-out disrespectful to the real-life people. You said it, Bonnie, and I'm pretty sure I could speak for just about everyone when I say this. What they did by replacing George Welsh and Kenneth Taylor with these two characters is unforgivable. These two were legends. They did not deserve to be cut out of the story like this. That's like saying that General Eisenhower didn't plan D-Day. My point is, you do not replace real heroes with fake ones. Also, another thing that they got wrong since they try to be accurate and yet not a history lesson, they did not shoot at hospitals. They were after the naval force. That's it. They didn't go after hospitals. All they did was go for the military base, leave everybody else alone. Bye-bye. I'm going to take a wild guess that the reason why they added in the bombing of the hospital is so that we, the American audience, could get the feeling that we were being attacked. But here's the thing. Bombing the naval ships was enough to make us know that we were in trouble. So, yeah, they overdid it by putting in the bombing of the hospitals, which, like I said, did not happen. And that's true, because Admiral Yamamoto gave very strict orders that they were not to attack civilians or hospitals. They were just supposed to attack the base and especially Battleship Row. However, in all honesty... I wouldn't have put it past them because it's no secret that during World War II, when they captured anyone, they tortured them, they made slaves out of them. Basically, they did not follow the Geneva Convention. So it's not a huge stretch of the imagination. But that's not the point. The point is, it never happened. So they shouldn't have put that in there. Now, those two facts alone are the crown jewels of inaccuracies in movies especially the parts about Danny and Rafe being the replacements for George Welsh and Kenneth Taylor. But that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the inaccuracies of this movie. One inaccuracy that World War II veterans would probably recognize the most would be the part where Rafe joins the Eagle Squadron. The fact is, active duty members of the Army Air Corps were not allowed to join that squadron. Civilians could, but not pilots who were still in the Army Air Corps. If you don't believe me, look up the story about the Flying Tigers. They were volunteers fighting for the Chinese Air Force. And I'm sure a lot of people will know that, yes, they were Army Air Corps pilots. But the only way they could join was to resign their commissions and then go volunteer. Even Colonel Chenault, who led the Flying Tigers, had to do that. Why? Because at that time, we were out of the war. We were, in a way, neutral. And if you had active members of the Army Air Corps there, then that would be a sign of aggression from us. Oh, sure, one could say that in the movie, maybe he just resigned his commission and all that. Sure, they could say that, but they didn't. And here's another one for you. You know how Danny and Rafe, they're fighter pilots, and they just get shoved into the Doolittle raid to bomb Tokyo? Well, fighter pilots do not become bomber pilots. It does not work that way. You are either one or the other. You cannot be both. It's a real honor to be a fighter pilot. Because when you're a fighter pilot, you're taking it to the enemy. You're shooting them down. When you're a bomber, all you do is just bomb a few factories and cities and such. Sure, the enemy will try to shoot you down, and hopefully you could get your licks in. But truth be told, the fighters have the bigger advantage compared to the bombers. Here's another one for you. There's a few times that you see some sailors smoking Marlboro cigarettes. Those didn't exist until the 1970s. I know, it's a stupid issue, but it's come up so much that I couldn't ignore it. And here's a very important one. There's a scene where torpedo planes are bombing the base. What are the torpedo planes doing bombing a base? They carry torpedoes. They're meant for the water, not for the land. You use bombs on the land, not torpedoes. The only mission the torpedo planes had was to blow up the ships. Let's give the Japanese some credit here, folks. They're smart enough to know what the planes and the ordnance was designed for. There is one big inaccuracy that needs to be talked about. However, I think Bonnie can tell you that story a lot better than I. So I'm going to leave it up to her. Thank you, movie fan. That particular moment that we are going to talk about is the Franklin Delano Roosevelt getting out of his chair scene. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, 
First, I'm going to give a little history lesson about it. So, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the only president that was diagnosed with polio. Back then, they thought that it was a life-killing, threatening disease, which ended up taking away the use of his legs. So, he was confided to a wheelchair whenever he was in the White House, out of the public eye, mind you. And anytime he was in public, he wore braces on his legs, or was walking on crutches, or had his son help him around, still making it look like he was okay, and he convinced the public that he was doing all right, that he was okay. But for the most part, very few people out in public knew about his disability and he did not masquerade around with it. He pretty much kept it hidden from the public eye. And so in this particular scene from Pearl Harbor, he's just learned about the damage that's been done at Pearl Harbor and the ships that have been lost and that there are still people trapped alive inside these ships and that the military base is doing all all they can. In the midst of it, he is motioning for war to be declared. The military base doesn't think that it's possible. And then he goes into detail talking about why he felt like God put him in this chair for a reason so that it can help him recognize beyond pride damages that can be done and he doesn't want anybody else to suffer the same damage and then one of the military leaders says Mr. President what you're asking for is impossible and in response to that he gets up out of his wheelchair struggles to stand upright and then says, do not tell me it can't be done. Now, this scene in itself isn't that bad, except for a couple reasons that the scene has been heavily criticized. One, that never happened. When he heard about it, he motioned for Congress to declare war in that famous, a date that will live in infamy speech. And second, he was not one masquerading about his disability or the consequences of it. He hid it from the public eye. Nobody was allowed to know it. Maybe few people in the White House, but it was always kept out of the public eye. Because back then, people figured that polio was a contagious death sentence for everybody. So he never talked about it. Thirdly, this is overkill. On top of the overkills that both movie fan and I have talked about, like bombing the hospitals and trying to make us Americans feel like that we've been attacked and that we're wounded without, oh, I don't know, making us actually care about it. Yeah, this is the basic of all overkills because the directors, writers are trying to inspire us to be proud to be American again. Almost like the war propaganda videos that we've seen. And that's what this scene is. It's a war War propaganda scene and it's not supposed to be that it's supposed to be Pearl Harbor what actually happened again it doesn't have to necessarily be a history lesson but Jerry Bruckheimer said this is meant to be accurate and that moment was just trying to over inspire us again to be proud to be American we don't need that tell the story as it was and if you want to add that scene Put it in a different moment because there are moments in history where people told them it's impossible. The Wrights brothers were told it's impossible and they said don't tell us it's impossible. People told the parents of Helen Keller she'll never make it in life. She made it in life. But to put this in here in a crucial moment is not really fitting. Yeah, it just brings out the mother of all overkills in here. If the writers and directors wanted us to be proud to be American, that's fine. Go ahead and inspire us, but do it in a story that actually helps us to care. Due to the fictional characters replacing the actual characters and the fictional characters not being interesting, as well as not helping the situation be interesting or help us care about Pearl Harbor, it doesn't inspire me at all. I couldn't have said it better myself, Bonnie. Now that's the stuff we covered in the original video. Now we're going to talk about the stuff that we had overlooked. Like this little part, for instance. I think World War II just started! Okay, I don't think you need to be a historian to know that that never happened. No one ever said those words when Pearl got bombed. Besides being a very stupid line, as everyone on YouTube is very kind enough to point out, it is completely inaccurate.
mostly because that word was supposedly used in a magazine printed back in 1939. Because Germany invaded Poland, then all of a sudden the British and the French were fighting Germany, and Japan invaded China, it was kind of obvious where this was going. And even then, nobody really referred to it as World War II. All they would ever say is lines like this, there's a war on, the big one. And there's a very good reason why they called it that, which I will have to do a video on one of these days. The fact is, it's not officially called World War II until some odd years later, most likely after the war. Right, Bonnie? Exactly, movie fan. And there's another reason why nobody back then would have said World War II or classified it as World War II was because back then the First World War or what they called back then the Great War, they believed that no other war would topple or be as horrific or gigantic as that. That is until what eventually became known as World War II came along. The reason why we can nowadays say World War III when it does come and Please, Lord, let it not come is because we've already had two gigantic wars that have been some of the worst and frightening that we have ever seen. So, yeah, for Michael Bay to directly say World War II at a time when nobody would have said World War II is lazy writing. And that brings up another big problem about this movie. We talked about the Marlboro cigarettes and how those would not have existed. It really was like... Michael Bay forgot to differentiate the past and the present or was just lazy about it. He also got his timeline wrong about the events. One of them is in the movie when Admiral Kimmel is notified that an enemy submarine was under attack. But during the actual events, Kimmel was not notified. He didn't know about it until hours after the attack ended. He instead heard of what was taking place only once the Japanese bombs had already fallen into the harbor. Did you really do your homework on this, Michael Bay? Or let me take a wild guess. You had a passion about this project at first, but then you wanted to get the next Transformers movie out as quick as possible, so you had to rush this script through with Randall Wallace. What do you think, movie fan? Do you think that's what happened? Well, not exactly, but I wouldn't put it past him. After all, this is Michael Bay we're talking about here. But the inaccuracies don't stop at Pearl Harbor. Nope. In fact, they even go on after the event. Case in point, the Doolittle Raid. Now, I've already talked about how fighter pilots do not become bomber pilots. It doesn't work that way. But there's one other thing I neglected to mention, and that was the big misrepresentation of the Doolittle Raid itself. In the movie, they were 624 miles away from Japan, and they had to take off because they saw patrol boats that would have warned that they were coming. In reality, they were 650 miles away, and there was only one patrol boat, and it was sunk. But they weren't going to take the chance. They had to take off right now before Japan got their defenses ready, or even worse, send out their aircraft carriers to get them. And you know what? Now that I think about it, the movie didn't say anything about sinking any boats, and they should have. And that, my friends, covers every major issue with the movie Pearl Harbor. Before we move on, here are some dishonorable mentions. <laughs> Finally, coming in at number one is a movie that is incredibly inaccurate beyond belief. In fact, it is so terrible that it is downright shameful. Shame. 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 Precisely. And that movie is Legend of Titanic. Bonnie, why don't you start this one off? With pleasure, movie fan. <laughs> okay, Legend of the Titanic. Where should I begin with this one? Oh, let's start with the plot. The plot basically is told from the perspective of a mouse that snuck aboard the Titanic. Okay, that's not bad. And brace yourself. Because it really gets weird. So the mouse is caught up with a love triangle with a woman named Rose. I mean, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth gets caught up talking to dolphins because they are asking for her help against whaling. And the Titanic sinks because of this whaler who can talk to sharks. I swear to you, I am not making any of this up. This is the real plot to this movie. If it was not the Titanic movie, we would not have put it on this list. 
Right, movie fan? Right, Bonnie. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yes, I know. That was a horrible thing to say. But looking at this movie, I don't feel ashamed to actually say it. And that's just sad. Why? Well, wait till you hear the rest of it. The plot alone is enough to say that everything's wrong with this movie, of course, obviously. But we had to look at some more details at what was wrong with this movie and how it got things wrong. The first off is that the maiden voyage takes place in England. Even the 1997 movie knew that they started in Ireland. They did not start in England. Movie fan, remind me, did they pick up any passengers along the way to England? Well, when Titanic took off from Belfast, of course she would have had her crew. Then she docked in England and picked up all the rich people who were going to be on the voyage. And of course she went and picked up passengers from Ireland. So, yes and no, really. But either way, that was not where the Maiden Voyage started. And also, how the good grief did you involve complicated talking animals in this whole set? And the problem as a story is that it has no focus. Is the focus supposed to be the mice, the love story, the whales? How did they, like, expect to tell this story? Were they just looking at the James Cameron movie and going, Rip, 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 make it a happier ending. Add the talking mice, make the talking animals. Oh, and we don't want to tell the kids the bad news that the Titanic died. No, we're going to put in Murdoch literally saying, There's room for everybody on the lifeboats. Yes, <laughs> that happens, by the way. <laughs> that really happens. And if you recall correctly, there were only 20 life. And yes, at least one could hold the weight of 70 men. But calculating that, there still would not have been enough to save everybody that night. Seriously? You're going to lie about it? Why don't you just add that they took their suitcases along as well? Oh, and how is there a boat available for the musicians? Yes, that actually happens. And... Get a load of this. Anybody who could not fit onto the lifeboats got rescued by riding the back of a whale. I sincerely wish I was making this up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and why did the Titanic sink in the first place? Which I'm surprised they actually acknowledge that the Titanic sank. Well, the reason why the Titanic sank was because... Are you ready for this movie, fan? Yes, I'm ready, Bonnie. Are you sure you're ready for this? As ready as I'll ever be. Okay. The reason the Titanic sunk is because the whaler who wants to marry this girl wants to get exclusive whaling rights and believes that marrying her will get him the rights to it as a honeymoon gift. And when he does not get his way, he gets impatient and communicates with the sharks that somehow have prison garments and tells them, make the ship sink. And so the sharks trick a gigantic octopus with a puppy dog face to throw an iceberg in front of the Titanic so that it will sink. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've officially lost my mind on that one. <laughs> I can see why, because that is absolutely ridiculous. There's no denying that that is the biggest problem with this whole movie. But there are other issues as well. Mostly subtle issues, but they're still there. One such problem would be Rose, I mean Elizabeth's dress that she's wearing when she's dancing with Jack, I mean Don Juan. You can clearly see that it is definitely not of the times. Why? Well, it's showing some cleavage on her, and I can tell you this for sure. Women didn't wear dresses like that back then. They were still stuck in a time when if a woman showed her ankles, that was considered pornography. I'm not joking. They were very strict about this sort of thing. Dresses like that wouldn't be seen until the late 1940s or 50s. What's even more wrong about this is the fact that there's even a close-up of her cleavage. And this is supposed to be a kid's movie. Here's another one for you. When the Titanic is heading straight for that iceberg, it is immediately spotted by the helmsman. And as everyone knows, the iceberg was spotted by lookout Frederick Fleet, not the helmsman. Every movie except this one has acknowledged that. Why they felt they had to change that is beyond me. And if that's not stupid enough, remember that giant octopus? He was told by one of the whales to hold the ship together because it was breaking. And he actually succeeds in holding it together, too. He even manages to save Captain Smith. 
But of course, that's not the worst of it. Bonnie? Easily the worst thing about this movie is not just that everybody lives, but just the fact that it literally turns the tragedy and death of 1,500 people into a Save the Whales propaganda. Yes, this pretty much is the equivalent of saying, oh, Moon Sprites rescued the planes from 9-11, and the moral is don't ever smoke. If you want to make a movie about whaling, that's fine. This was the 90s where they were making preachy movies about environmental messages which is not terrible, but it's terrible when you put it into history and when you use that to spit on the watery graves of 1,500 documented men, women, and children who died that night. Shame on you, movie. Just shame on you. Shame on the makers. Shame on the actors. Shame on the animators. And shame, big time, on the writers for this movie. Shame, shame on you. Shame, shame on you Can you hold your head up high Look each other in the eye No, you can't Shame on you And I never thought I would say that About any movie in my life I'm with you, Bonnie I've seen bad before But this is absolutely ridiculous The fact is, as much as we wish It never happened, it did We can't just try to pretend that that never happened it's not just shameful, it's morally wrong. Because you can't try to whitewash history like that. I couldn't agree more, a movie fan. Which brings up something that I'm sure you're all wondering right now. What about the animated Titanic with the rapping dog? Why did we not put it on the list? Because to that movie's credit, and very small credit, it actually does try a little to be historically accurate. Keyword being very little, but they also do not deny that there were people who died that night. They give hints, but they acknowledge it. They also acknowledge that there were not enough lifeboats for everybody. So, yeah, the film with the rapping dog is actually a little more accurate than this movie. How do you sink that low? <laughs> And that is why for all the insults that this movie threw at history and the people who died that night, that we deem this the number one most inaccurate movie and probably the worst insult to movies that are trying to be historically accurate. Well, movie fan, that was a lot of fun. I guess it's time to go, so this is a... Uh... Hold up there, Bonnie. This isn't the most inaccurate movie ever made. What do you mean, this is not it? We actually have one that's even worse than this. What? There's one movie that is so horribly inaccurate, in fact, it's so gut-wrenchingly insulting, that it supersedes number one. It's so terrible that I had to call it number zero. Uh, no, please, no, no, no. If there was going to be a number zero, it would have to be worse than this one. Oh, it is beautiful. It truly is. How could there possibly be anything worse? There is one movie. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Please tell me it's not... It's not... That's right, The Magic Voyage. Ah! <laughs> I know, beautiful. I didn't want to cover this myself after seeing how horrible this is. But for the sake of the public, and especially for the sake of accuracy, we need to cover this. For those of you who've never heard of this movie, and I'm sure a lot of you haven't, it's basically a story about Christopher Columbus's adventure to discover the New World. Now, I know we're all familiar with the story of Christopher Columbus, how he set out in 1492 and ended up discovering the West Indies, which was officially declared as the New World. Now, for those of you who remember that story, put it out of your mind right now, because this movie is nothing like that at all. In fact, this movie is so inaccurate that it defies explanation. In fact, literally everything is wrong about this movie. And because of that, we have to start from the beginning. The movie starts by telling us the story of how people believed the Earth was flat, and it's shown as this narrow sheet of land just floating in space. And the narrator tells us that Columbus believes the Earth is not flat. In fact, he believes the Earth is square, until a little woodworm, who was formerly a bookworm, comes and whittles out some of the edges. And then Columbus comes to the conclusion that the Earth is round, because technically the worm told him so. Hmm, let's see. Is there anything right about that at all? Judges? Mm. 
Of course not. None of that is right at all. I'll start with the obvious story of the Earth being flat. Now, we all know how this goes. Everyone says the Earth was flat, and Columbus says, no, he believes the Earth was round. Now, we've all heard that story before, and it's one of the big mythologies to Columbus's voyage. The mythology being that everyone knew the Earth was round by then. Columbus wasn't the first one to theorize that. And in fact, it had actually been proven way before he ever existed. Like I said before, with all fairness, that was a myth that has been going around for over 50 years. Years, mostly due to those TV specials. But either way, he did not believe that the Earth was square. And another thing, and this one's more on a scientific level here, you cannot be a bookworm and then go through years of your life chewing through books, and then all of a sudden you can eat wood without any trouble. Now, I'm sure we all know that is physically impossible. So right from the start, we end up screwing with history in a really bad way. And this is only the first two minutes of the film. And to quote a line from the 1997 version of Babes in Toyland, the worst is yet to come. Right, Bonnie? Oh, you can bet the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria that things are going to get worse, movie fan. <laughs> Let's pick up from where Columbus goes to meet King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. And Columbus presenting his theory that the Earth is round because the woodworm told him so. In reality, if he had said that to anybody at all, even the king and queen, he would have instantly been put in a sane asylum. Which is where this movie belongs! And he was there to present his theory that he could travel all the way across the Atlantic and to Asia without any interference or anything. They didn't have to go painfully traveling across land to trade with Asia anymore. They could just go across the Atlantic. The only reason they've never tried that is because it was a scary idea. There was a great unknown about the ocean. But Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand funded the voyage. And here's another thing that the movie got wrong. Why did Queen Isabella fund the trip in the movie? Because she's infatuated by him instantly. And it is disgusting to watch. Not only does she flirt with him in front of her husband, but he's also infatuated by her. And if you look at history again, you'll know that they were not infatuated for a couple reasons. One, they were friends. They were mutual about it. And also, any queen who had an affair with anybody who was not her husband, the king, that would have been called treason. She knew better than to do that. She would have lost her head. And things get even worse from there. With the fan fiction idea of having Pico have a love interest that is Princess of the Moon Sprites, who has been kidnapped by the Swarm Lord and then gets kidnapped again to be taken all the way across the ocean. So now what is Columbus's goal? To prove that the Earth is round, to get gold for the king and queen, and to rescue Pico's love interest. I'm sorry, did our history books forget that? I am so sorry. Did did we really forget to add Columbus sailed the ocean blue and rescued the Princess Sprite anew? What? <laughs> Movie fan, do you think I need to say anything about how idiotic that idea is at all? No, you don't need to, because I'll do it for you. That is one of the most idiotic things I've ever seen and heard in my life. I mean, seriously, we got overlords that are consisted of bugs. Do you think Oogie Boogie's gonna be there? Because as I recall, he was a whole bunch of bugs inside of a burlap sack. What bugs me even more about this whole thing with the king and queen is the fact that, besides the obvious fact that Queen Isabella and Columbus, that never happened at all. Sure, she talked the king into financing the expedition, but it wasn't for that purpose. It was for political gain. And what I mean by that is, if Columbus was right and this proved to be a shortcut, then they would get a lot more trade goods even faster. In fact, their economy would probably go through the roof and they'd be the richest kingdom in all of Europe. Gold had nothing to do with it. Oh sure, every now and again you hear about the riches of China and Japan and that's what they were going for, but what they were really talking about was trading with the people. We're talking stuff like spices, silk, gunpowder, and technically knowledge, because, you know, in other countries, they discover stuff that other countries didn't know about, and they decide to practice that themselves. And that could be anything from medicine to inventions, anything that can help their country progress. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if gold was in the back of their minds in some way, but that was not the main goal. The main goal was to establish a better trade route, one that was hopefully even shorter. And if that's not bad enough, the voyage was even worse. I say that because while they're on the voyage, 
the crew is planning a mutiny, and Columbus calms them down and gets them to change their minds by singing them one of the most horrendous songs I've ever seen in a kid's film. In fact, this makes Beyond the Mysterious Beyond sound good. I'm not kidding. Bonnie, you better cover that, because if I keep going, I'm gonna lose it. You asked for it, movie fan! Keep in mind, you asked for it! <laughs> okay. So what do they do in this song, and how does it not relate to history? Well, several ways in just one song does it not relate to history. So basically, these three guys are going to cause a mutiny on the ship. Okay, I that kind of happened. And then Columbus comes out playing a concertina and singing about all these sailors and how the life at sea is a great time, giving historical examples like Ulysses, according to Greek mythology, or the Romans and the Vikings. And if fixes it for a little bit. Where do I even start on what's wrong with that moment? Okay. <sighs> Let's start with the fact that a concertina was not invented until 1829. And it was invented in England, not in Spain or Italy during 1492. <laughs> Also, on every account, he also gets the Romans wrong, the Vikings wrong, and Ulysses wrong! And even more so, Ulysses was considered legend at the time. It was not proven if he was real or not. Leave in the comments a debate on whether he's real or not. But in 1492, he would have been considered mythology legend. And the worst part about it is the history of this moment. Yes, there was talk of mutiny. They were wanting to turn around. Everybody wanted to turn around. And Columbus said, give me three days. If we don't see land by then, I will turn around. And to sweeten the deal even more, he promised that whoever spotted land first would be richly rewarded. And... That promise was broken as well when on the Pinta, Rodrigo de Triana spotted land. He was never given that reward. So to insultingly say that they solved this quickly by a song instead of negotiating about it makes this even more dumb and angers me. And as a song quality, it is not good either. The singer Dom DeLuise is fine because it's what he's given and he can do some pretty good singing. The problem was it sounds like both the dubbing and the writing. It sounds like he's making up these words on the spot. And that's what's wrong with that song. I also have to add that there's a moment where the crew actually tries to hang Columbus and they see land before then. That never happened. I think if the real Columbus saw that scene, he would be grateful that his peaceful talk with his crew members saved his neck, literally. Movie fan, would you like to finish off the rest of the plot and what's wrong with the rest of the plot? Yes, I would, Bonnie, because it gets even stupider from here. If you think that's not possible, wait till you hear the rest of it. When they sight land, they are immediately attacked by the swarm. Hmm. Judges, was Columbus attacked by anything on his voyage? <clears throat> Didn't think so. And when they get past the swarm, they're immediately greeted by a beaver. Okay, we don't need the judges for this one because everybody knows that beavers are native to America, not the West Indies. And on top of that, they do find gold in an Aztec temple. Hmm. Funny thing, as I recall, it was Cortez who first discovered the Aztecs. I could be wrong, though. Say, judges, did Christopher Columbus discover the Aztecs? <coughs> That's what I thought. So once again, they screwed up history. And after they destroy the swarm and rescue Pico's girlfriend, they take a solid gold Aztec statue away, and they're chased out of the New World by the Aztecs, because apparently they worshipped the swarm. That and they didn't like the gold being stolen either. Also, in answer to a question that you probably might be asking, are the Native Americans racist looking in this? Oh, you bet! They are racist looking in this, and this is a real shame. And even the way they talk is not culturally correct. And when they leave, Columbus talks about how someday this new land will be a big bustling city, and we see New York emerge out of it. Now, I'm sure you all know the real truth, but just for the sake of argument, judges, did Columbus really land on America or even Manhattan Island? 
Now that's just sad that they had to make up such a huge lie. Sure, there's a mythology claiming that Columbus discovered America, but the fact is, no, he didn't. He landed in the West Indies, and Americo Vespucci landed in America and named the country after himself, America. It's kind of a little myth you used to hear in elementary school to just kind of dumb it down for the little kids, but they corrected that a long time ago. Now, to be fair, it's possible that that whole scene was meant to be a metaphor of him discovering the new world that would eventually become the United States of America. But still, that's completely wrong. For all these reasons, we have put this at number zero. While I still think it is one of the most offensive things to say that the death of 1,500 people never happened, this entire movie is unbelievably offensive in how it presents itself and markets itself to little kids. That's another big question that I'm sure that you're all going to be asking us. Why bother? Those two are just kids' movies, just like Pocahontas was a kids' movie. Here's a big difference why we care about these subjects very much and why for kids we need to be careful and not careless like Legend of the Titanic or Magic Voyage. The reasons are because look at something like Nest Entertainment or the audio version of Adventures in Odyssey where they have a kid go visit Columbus. Heck, even look at the Alvin and the Chipmunks episode where they retell the story of Christopher Columbus. They do it in such a way that kids could both laugh and understand history and it doesn't interfere with what really happened or deny anything that had happened. They may leave out gruesome details about what happened in the aftermath, but they make an effort to share this is what happened. Maybe when you grow older, you'll learn more details of what had happened in the aftermath. Or if you can't even do that, look at what Pocahontas and the Danny K version of Hans Christian Andersen did. They made an effort to at least tell a story in a way where they could also say, maybe when you're older, you'll study these people a little more. And also, we are not accurate and we acknowledge that. So, yeah, these movies made no effort or attempt to try and be that way with the kids. We got one movie saying, the deaths of 1,500 people never happened. It was all an anti-whaling propaganda. And we got another movie that is just a blunder of mess. The worst part about that one is this came out in 1992 and this was the 500 year celebration of when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. A few other movies about Columbus came out around that time as well and while they were not critically well received, I'll bet you my entire bank account that they were more accurate than this movie or at least made more of attempt to be accurate than this movie and another thing that is terrible about it is that the director Schumann stated that the film was intended to be about the discovery of America from a more satirical point of view in order to present Columbus as a lovable charming and befuddled scholar where was the satire where was the humor where was I supposed to laugh? I've seen Buddy Python do better satire than this, and they're for adults. I've seen satire in kids' films, and they're funny. There's no satire in here. And I'm sure that all of you are ready to put in the comments how not lovable Columbus was to begin with. Yes, he was a man of broken promises. He eventually enslaved anybody. Seriously, a befuddled scholar? While studying maps is a form of scholarship, he was not that much of a scholar. He knew maps better than most things. Back to my first argument, if you are going to present Columbus in a lovable way, or even make him the least bit likable, and not interfere with history, like I said, look again back at Nest Entertainment, Adventures in Odyssey, and Alvin and the Good Grief and Chipmunks! Because if they could do it in a way where they could not interfere with history, then you have a lot to look up to. I mean, the fact that chipmunks can put more effort than you, you need to be ashamed of yourselves big time! Shame, shame on you. Shame, shame on you. Can you hold your head up high? Look each other in the eye. No, you can't. Shame on you. 
sketchy movie fan, the reason why that it's barely talked about, especially by something like Watch Mojo, is because, well, Watch Mojo knew that if they brought this up, they'd probably go insane. And I don't blame them the least bit. This movie is pure insanity. It sure is, Bonnie, on so many levels. It's insane, it's shameful, and because of the false history that it gives, it is downright disgraceful. Exactly. There is literally nothing accurate about this at all. And what saddens me the most is the fact that Dom DeLuise plays Christopher Columbus, and he's a way better actor than this. I know a lot of people like to criticize a troll in Central Park, and you can say what you will about that, but you gotta admit one thing. That one actually had a pretty good story. It was charming, it was lovable, Stanley was a great character you couldn't help but like. This, on the other hand, is a big pile of sh since you brought up about Dom DeLuise, movie fan, mind if I bring up another tragedy? Go ahead. The animation was done by Phil Nibblink. For those of you who don't know, he was an animator for films like Fox and the Hound, The Great Mouse Detective, and Good Grief and Roger Rabbit! One of the greatest animated movies I've ever seen. And he does this crappy animation. He's the animation director, key animator, and story artist for The Magic Voyage. You were in Roger Rabbit! What are you doing in this? And this is a way to throw away your career because just about almost everybody looks awful and the environment looks awful. That is a cry and shame. It really is. How this even got off the ground is beyond me. This is one of those movies where it would be best that nobody knew this ever existed. I'm talking gather up all the DVDs, all the VHS tapes, the script, the original negatives, you name it, all of it, and throw it in a big bonfire. Because this thing is insulting beyond belief. In fact, I never knew this existed until we started this project. Bonnie told me about it, and, you know, I had to see this for myself, and oh my god, I wish I didn't. It was horrible. Just thinking about the song that Dom DeLuise is singing gives me nightmares. Oh, the life to see is a life for me. No love is a land of me. La 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 Oh, the life as the sea is the life for me. No love is a land of me. We love it despite it, delighted to fight it. What other life could they be? You see? And like Bonnie already said, Alvin and the Chipmunks did a better job than this. And that's just sad, because Alvin and the Chipmunks was not meant to be a historical show. But yet they managed to keep it historically accurate with a little humor on the side, like there's a few gags like them giving the Native Americans t-shirts, which, as we all know, didn't exist yet. But that was funny! Bottom line, when you take every little detail into account here, that's why we made it number zero on this list. Before we go, I want to thank Bonnie from Joy Unicycle for helping me out on this one. I really couldn't have done it without her. Honestly, I couldn't have done this without you either, movie fan. And this was actually a lot of fun to go over and review. And not just list what is inaccurate about these movies, but why they are inaccurate and can they still be enjoyable. I honestly think if the stories can be told in the right way, it can be enjoyable. Like, I know people enjoy Pocahontas, and a lot of people enjoy Braveheart. While other movies like Pearl Harbor and The Legend of the Titanic are pretty much reviled for not just their inaccuracy, but poor storytelling. So, I think this was a great review, honestly, movie fan, and I'm glad that we did it. So am I, Bonnie. And hopefully in the near future, we could talk about the movies that were accurate. But until then... This is Bonnie from Joy Unicycle saying see you next time. And as always, this is Movie Fan, signing off.